Awesome. So first off, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I know there's a couple others going on right now, so I appreciate you all coming to this one. Hope I can leave you with something that you can apply right, even right after this talk. So a lot of students in here? No? Couple? Here we go. Don't be shy. Raise your hands. Uh, yeah, you know, pay attention in this talk. Again, there's a lot of concepts I'm going to show you, tools, things like that, that you can actually apply. I know some security conferences could be a little bit higher level, uh, but B-Sides is great. Uh, so take everything in and, you know, try these things, apply them at your home if you're able to. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about how to level up your threat hunting using threat intelligence. And we're going to start off going through a few slides just based on some requirements that you guys should have when building an effective threat hunting program. But then towards the end, uh, we're going to actually walk through a threat hunt that I've conducted in the past with a partner of mine. And we'll look at real live examples and uh, show you how to find them yourselves. So a little bit about me first. Uh, I am Michelangelo Zumo. I just go by Zumo. You can find me on Discord. My Discord ID is up there. I'm also probably the only Michelangelo Zumo on LinkedIn, so you don't need to memorize that URL. You could probably just search me and find me there. Um, but I started my career out in the Marine Corps. I was a Marine Corps. Oh God! Did I hear a bark? Oh, jeez! Everyone take cover. <laughs> um, but uh, I started out in Marine Corps Intelligence. I was a Korean linguist uh, doing national security, worked at the NSA for a few years, uh, and then transitioned into cyber when I did my master's in cybercrime investigations and cybersecurity. Did a lot of digital forensics and law enforcement. I'm from Tampa, originally from New Jersey, but I, I've relocated to Tampa now. I was just at B-Side St. Pete last week uh, where I did this same uh, demonstration. So. Again, thank you all for, for joining. So first, let's define what threat hunting is. And to me, I learned this a few years ago, threat hunting is honestly just a constant game of cat and mouse. It's finding the threats, the evidence of the threats, the threat actors before they find you or your organization, uh, which can be pretty challenging if you don't really know what you're looking for. Uh, so we're gonna go through some of the steps in how to conduct a threat hunt, and identify some of the key requirements that you need uh, and the evidence that you're going to be looking for. So one of the first prerequisites, prerequisites when building your threat hunt is identifying your critical assets. And your critical assets can be anything that's important to your organization, but identifying them, what they are, where they're located, who has access to them, and what type of data is accessible or hosted on those assets is going to be really important to uh, understand when you're trying to identify your critical assets. Every organization has, uh, you, know, you know, large organizations have big fingerprints, footprints out there, uh, and there's probably tons of assets that they can be monitoring for, but identifying those priority ones is going to allow your threat hunting to be more effective um, and, and focused on the types of threats that you guys should be monitoring for. And when you're inventorying these assets, there's a few things that you're wanting, going to keep note of. I apologize for the size of the font here, but I'll, I'll, I'll highlight some of the, the main ones. You definitely want to be take, taking note of your assets, make, model, OS versions, uh, because threat actors are constantly looking for vulnerabilities into the different devices, applications uh, that you're trying to protect. So understanding all those different details for each of your assets is going to allow your threat hunting team to focus in on, again, specific threats and identify any active exploits targeting those assets uh, and allow you to better defend them. Other things, again, I mentioned earlier you're going to want to take note of is what types of data uh, and who has access to those assets. You know, in, in today's world, pre, post, and during COVID, uh, you know, we're largely a remote workforce now across many different industries. So understanding where your assets are located, who has access to them, who needs, you know, what per permissions and privileges do they have on those assets are all things you're going to want to understand so your threat, intel, your threat intel team or your threat hunting team knows how to better defend against uh, active threats. And also, when inventorying, 
you know, it can be pretty difficult to understand what assets are out there uh, that threat actors can get their hands on. We're going to go through some of the ways that threat actors do recon on your organization. And these are all open source tools, and I'll show you guys those. Um, but using tools like that is going to allow you to understand you know, if somebody in HR department on the other side of the country is setting up some website where they're putting your organization's IP or any information on that might cause a breach. Uh, so you want to, again, understand where these assets are located and who has access to them. Prerequisite number two is really up to your threat intelligence teams, the analysts, the threat hunters to identify the priority intel requirements, your PIRs. And these are gonna be created once you've identified the critical assets that you guys want to protect. And this is gonna really allow them to stay focused. Uh, Michael James was talking earlier in one of the rooms on OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. And one of the issues he brought up was setting a too wide of a scope. Uh, because there's a ton of things that you can be investigating out there when it's open source intelligence, uh, deep and dark web intelligence, um, you know, cyber intelligence. And if you set too wide of a scope, you're gonna be collecting so much data, you're not even know what, you're, you're not even gonna know what you're looking at. So setting those priority intel requirements, for example, if you have a remote workforce, you've got people logging in from their homes, you wanna identify the types of threats that they're prone to, and then start investigating the types of evidence you might find, the types of threats that you might find that are targeting those types of users, uh, and then focus your, your intelligence gathering and investigations on those threats, rather than just saying, hey, today I'm gonna go find some threats, because you could find plenty of them, but they might not actually line up with your priority intel requirements. Then we're gonna plan the hunt. So again, the purpose, what are we looking for? Why are we about to conduct this, this hunt? And for many organizations, it's easy. Well, we want to better defend ourselves. We want, to be, we want to get ready, prepare ourselves for the next potential attack. We want to see what other organizations in our industry are being targeted by, and what kinds of indicators compromiders, compromise, what kinds of risk can we find in our threat hunt to better defend ourselves? Setting that scope. Again, setting too wide of a scope is gonna make it very hard for you to come up with quick results, quick results that you could take action on. So picking one threat at a time, investigating, analyzing those threats, and then moving on to the next one. It's okay to conduct multiple threat hunts, but you don't want to conduct one giant one. And then understanding your limitations. And there could be a lot of different limitations you come across. One of the main ones for me is what tools do we have access to? And again, we're gonna go in a few slides here, we're gonna talk about some of the open source tools that you can use. We're gonna talk about premium tools that you can use as well. Uh, but limitations and the types of tools that you have access to may determine how quickly you can conduct a threat hunt and how efficient it, it can be. Uh, and when you're determining these tools, you're also gonna to wanna to identify any of the potential gaps uh, because of the lack of tools that you have or the lack of visibility that you might come across. So let's equip the hunt. For many of you that are already in security roles uh, or if you're a student learning about these, uh, there are a ton of different resources out there that you can get your hands on to help you start hunting, you know, just create a foundation of places where you can start hunting and identifying these threats, even if they're not targeting your organization. Uh, but things like open source intelligence feeds, uh, ISAC feeds for whatever industry that you might be in, is gonna be a good place to start so you can just start consuming intelligence around indicators of compromise and what, what other organizations, what other security personnel are observing out there uh, in, in the attack field. Also, Google is a great, it's a great tool. I'll show you uh, in a couple of slides some advanced searches that you could do uh, to help you, one, do some discovery and seeing what assets of yours might actually be out there accessibly, accessible on the internet, but also to just do research on what is everybody else talking about uh, in cybersecurity? What types of threats are common right now? Things like you know Twitter feeds, for example. It's, it's, a, it's a great place to go 
I wouldn't spend all your time there, but you know, people are constantly tweeting out the latest vulnerability, the latest exploit kit, or the latest indicator of compromise for whatever attack it might be. Web spiders, you could build your own, of course, uh, and you could just start scraping, you know, the clear web, you could try and do the deep and dark web, uh, and, and other types of sources as well. Uh, but web spiders are gonna come in with a lot of your premium tools where they're collecting data sources uh, from all over the internet and giving you sort of a central location uh, where you can simply just search and analyze for any potential threats, which is gonna be useful for, especially those that are just starting out that might not understand or know where these threats typically exist or where they're being discussed. Um, that could be one of the biggest barriers that you come across uh, when getting into threat hunting is not knowing where to look, especially from an ex ex external perspective. And then we talked about some of these other ones. Again, security blogs. I like, I like reading the, the Talos blog. Um, CrowdStrike has a great blog as well. Uh, those are great places to just see what is trending out there, what new attacks are coming up, uh, and, and they often are identifying indicators of compromise uh, that you can use to defend uh, yourselves. Now we're going to execute the hunt. The first step of executing the hunt is, in my opinion, the worst one. It's the collection. Uh, this was, you know, as an Early, in, early on in my career, uh, when I was basically just a data analyst, uh, was you know I was responsible for collecting everything, putting it, putting it in spreadsheets, uh, trying to extract whatever analysis I can out of it. Uh, the collection, though, can be the the most taxing portion of your threat hunt, uh, and it also could be the end of your threat hunt right at the beginning because you don't know where to collect from, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so it's gonna be important to identify the different data sources that you want to collect for your threat hunt so that you can minimize as many gaps as possible where evidence of these threats might exist uh, when you're conducting your threat hunt. Processing the data is also a difficult portion, but there's many tools out there that will process data for you. Uh, both structured and unstructured data. And this is gonna be important uh, to process data so that you can, again, quickly extract uh, any types of data sets that you want from the data that you've collected, uh, but then also to apply playbooks in your different systems that you might already be using, uh, and also to allow your analyst to analyze it. That's my favorite portion uh, beyond, you know, after the collection step is the analysis. And I, you know, there was talks earlier about automation and a lot of these things being done uh, just through machines. But I firmly believe that you're always going to require an analyst uh, to review data or threats. Uh, because, I mean, if we get to a point where machines can make decisions for us, then I guess that's great. But uh, ultimately, it's gonna be up to the, uh, the analyst to, again, understand what are the PIRs that we have set and once we've received the threat, is this something that really matches up with what we're trying to protect ourselves against? Uh, and what types of actions can we take? Lots of threats are unique, uh, so you, you, know, you can have to come up with different playbooks every once in a while. So being able to review those threats uh, rather than just you know, blanketing a playbook for any type of threat uh, comes in is why an analyst role is so important. And then conclusion. This one is the, this one uh, I like the most because I remember being in roles where people before me conducted investigations, whether I was in military, law enforcement, cybersecurity, uh, and I've seen you know, the results of those investigations, but I didn't know how they conducted it. So we're gonna talk about making sure that whatever threat hunt you conduct, uh, make sure it's as repeatable as possible for yourselves, and for everybody that follows you afterwards. Uh, I, I believe in karma, so document your threat hunts so that the next person in line uh, has an easier time conducting their threat hunt because you don't know what point in, uh, of their career that they're in, uh, and it might be a brand new concept for them. Uh, and hopefully, if you document it, 
then your next role might be easier and hopefully somebody that you replace or uh, you know, take over responsibilities for has documented as well and make your lives a little bit easier. And then evaluating the hunt. So once we've conducted our hunt, you should have, you should reflect on it and see how efficient was it? Were there any gaps that we identified during our threat hunt, which delayed uh, our, our results? Um, you know, did we identify anything that we were lacking, which prevented us from seeing specific types of threats that we should be investigating? Uh, and that's gonna be, again, looking at, did we collect from the right data sources? And did we have the right tools in place to allow us to collect or analyze that data? So ensuring that you're evaluating your threat hunts every time you conduct them uh, to make it, uh, and to improve upon them for your next threat hunt is a very important part of the process. Don't skip this process. Uh, and then concluding them as well. Uh, Sharing act and find, I was gonna jump ahead there for a second, but in this field, uh, and it's, it's the same in the military and, and in law enforcement, the government as well, pretty much everywhere, I guess, um, it's very easy to go unnoticed. And when, uh, when you are noticed, it's usually for bad things. A breach happened, or you messed something up, you shut down a database by accident, or you ran a tool that you weren't supposed to. So when you conduct these threat hunts, you've documented them, and you've come up with an action plan because of that threat hunt, make sure you report it. Show your bosses, show, show your manager, managers, so show your executive leadership, uh, and get the credit that you deserve. This is not an easy field, and again, uh, oftentimes there's not enough people that are promoting their employees, uh, showing the work that you have done, communicating it up to executive management, so make sure that you are doing those for yourselves so that the hard work that you're conducting is, is, is seen uh, by the right people. So how does this work in practice? This is gonna be the fun part. Uh, I got through all the slides, all the words. These are probably all the words that, uh, that I was able to type are done with pretty much for now. Everything else is gonna be pretty pictures and screenshots. Um, but uh, the next se several slides are gonna be an actual threat hunt that I've conducted with a partner. And I actually just inserted a couple new slides from a recent breach that we'll talk about, the Uber breach. I'm sure you all heard about it. Uh, I'm still taking Uber though. Um, but I included a couple new slides in there since my last talk at, at St. Pete. But when, it, when we start our threat hunt, again, uh, assume that I already have PIRs. Now I'm working with a partner, so I collect their PIRs, uh, and it allows me to understand, all right, what are you trying to protect? What types of threats do you want to find? Uh, and, and see if there's any evidence within your environment uh, that we need to take action on. So in this case, again, remote workforce, uh, one of the most common types of threats uh, that we see targeting partners today, organizations today, are those that are gained through initial access. Phishing, supply chain compromise, trust relationships, valid accounts. Uh, for the new people, the students that may not have gone, uh, in, dived into threat intelligence or threat hunting yet, uh, the MITRE framework is gonna be one of your best friends when trying to understand what types of threats are out there, what types of threats are you prone to, and what types of evidence might you, might you find for those threats. This is a great starting place for your threat hunts and it allows you to create that scope to, to stay very focused on your threat hunts and not kind of go down some of those rabbit holes that you can easily go down in this field. So familiar, familiarize yourself with the MITRE framework. Uh, it, it's a great resource and they, they build their, their framework in a very convenient way to read and, and explore. So I highly encourage you to you know, even log in right now to, to, to take a look at it. And one of the most common places that we see threats like initial access, uh, valid accounts, compromised third parties and vendors and things like that, are dark web marketplaces. Marketplaces like the one you see on the screen, Russian market, 
Too Easy, Genesis, Jamia, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't know, it's just what I call it. Uh, there's several others like it, they pop up, it seems like, every single day. And there's also plenty of different forms, both clear, deep, and dark forms where threat actors are auctioning off accounts that are, that are captured the very same way these marketplaces are capturing them. And what these marketplaces do is they use programs like Azure, Redline Stealer, not the Mandiant Redline, Vidar, Raccoon, Info Stealer. There's a ton of these tools out there, both paid and free or cracked, uh, that threat actors are, can get their hands on very easily and deploy just with basically pointing it at uh, a, a URL or trying to infect a victim's machine uh, and then they can start harvesting credentials for that victim's accounts very quickly. It's basically just a point of a but push of a button once they download it. We'll, we'll show you later how, how easy it is to find tools like this. Uh, but again, a lot of them are paid, some of them are free, and they're very accessible. And the Uber breach, Uber acknowledges themselves, they announced it as you can see in the, in the Uber newsroom here. Uh, acknowledge that the contractor that was compromised in this attack uh, likely had their information stolen by one of those programs that I had on that previous slide uh, and then sold on a dark web marketplace. So I forget when this was, I think it was last week or I forget what date we are at, but it was either last week or the week before that. And again, they said that the account for this contractor was likely sold on a dark web marketplace. Well, if you're familiar with these marketplaces that I showed on that previous slide, then you would be able to log into one of those and find an account, for example, the one here on the left-hand side of the screen. I apologize, it's kind of hard to see it on that screen there, so let me highlight that. On 9-15-2022, we could see that Someone's account to uber.onelogin.com was listed for sale for $10 on this marketplace. So interesting thing, interesting about these threat actors that sell these accounts on these marketplaces is they're not actually vetting the data that they capture through their stealer programs, and they don't even know that they have access, like in this case, this uber.onelogin.com because they capture so many of these every single day, they sell them for as little as a dollar in some cases, and there's so many threat actors buying these things up that it doesn't matter to them what, what types of access that they can have uh, through the accounts that they capture. They're gonna make money anyway. But what we see is ransomware threat actors, sophisticated APT groups, things like that, they know that these groups, these vendors, are getting access, like in this Uber instance, and they're strolling these marketplaces, purchasing these initial access, these compromised accounts for just a few dollars, and then they're able to wreak a lot of damage on these organizations as we've seen. In fact, with the Uber one, if you search a little bit more on these, on these marketplaces, there was actually five accounts with uber.onelogin.com in that same week that that breach happened. So it's very likely that whatever contractor was compromised had several other employees that were compromised as well, which I'm sure by now Uber has taken, I hope, has, uh, has fixed that and, and has identified uh, what I was able to surface through my investigation. But Uber's not the, the partner that I worked with in the, in the threat hunt that we're gonna keep going through here. It just happens to be a recent example that I want to show you. Uh, you know, based on the types of threats that we see out there. So, when you're conducting your threat hunt, again, you want to understand what your critical assets are. And so for some people, they might have difficulty in identifying these assets. So, you want to then perform reconnaissance on yourselves, because this is what threat actors are doing. This is, this is how they're footprinting your organization to identify where are we going to start our attack, or where are we going to at least try to get in. And a lot of them use open source tools like, we, like you see here. It's a little hard to see it up there, but DNS Dumpster, Search Search, DNS Recon, Whois, even Google. These are all tools that they're using to perform 
open source intelligence on your organizations to identify the assets that they're going to start targeting. There's a few screenshots here, and for this particular partner, because it is a pretty high value target, I did redact their name, uh, but I assure you, you all know who it is, and you might be able to identify it based on some of the screenshots you'll see uh, in the next few slides. But in this case, I've redacted their, their name, and I just made up my own Zumo bank uh, that we'll use as the victim in this case. But we can see here, again, we can do some who is searches, we can do some search searches to look for any type of subdomains that are registered by the same organization. Same thing these threat actors are doing to identify your assets. DNF stump, DNS dumpster, if you're not old school, like I, I'm not old school. Uh, I, like, I like a fresh GUI, uh, I hate going into the terminal, so DNS dumpster is one of my best friends. Uh, if you're like me, I, I recommend it, uh, or even just Google. Uh, and you can see two of, those slot, uh, two of those images here, one of DNS dumpster, where you can identify some of those publicly exposed domains, subdomains. And then even Google is very useful to do some advanced searches on and kind of help through the process of elimination just help you identify what assets are publicly available or accessible. Uh, in this case here, uh, I, I, I use Twitch as a different example, uh, but you can see that I removed www.twitchtv uh, from my results and then I looked for any other subdomain with Twitch TV and then you can see we're, we're able to identify a status.twitchtv which basically just tells you if Twitch is up or not. Uh, and then there's even a developer.twitchtv. So again, threat actors are performing these same types of reconnaissance steps to footprint your organization and look for attack vectors. In B-Side St. Pete last week, uh, there was a keynote speaker, Dr. Sunny Ware. She's the uh, CISO at FIS down in Florida. And she started her career out similar to how I started my career out, uh, but she was more on the pen testing side uh, and, and code development. And she had this funny example where she talked about where she was so eager and so uh, anxious to get started where you know, she downloaded Kali and used, you know, just started playing around with all of the tools that come pre-installed on Kali Linux. Um, I had a similar story. Oh, well, so the result of that was she was playing around with all the tools and she, uh, she shut down a lot of her own organization's databases, which got her in a lot of trouble. She's still a CISO today, so she, she made it okay. Uh, but I have a similar story where I was playing around with DNS Recon and uh, and I, you know, just went ahead. I thought I knew what the tool does, and hit the play button on it. Pointed it at. I, I think at that time I pointed at something, you know, uh, maybe something like hack this site or something like that. Um, but uh, if you don't read the documentation, or if you didn't read the documentation, once the program starts, you're, you know, all of a sudden in big red bold letters comes up, you know, brute forcing initiated or something like that. I was like, oh crap. Um, so make sure when you play around with some of these open source tools that you read the documentation, read the man pages, uh, read the help files, because you don't want to just point a tool at some domain and then hit play. You might get yourself blocked by an organization that you might not want to be blocked by. Or worse. So we've done our reconnaissance and now we're looking for some easy ways in into that organization. And one of those easy, way are, easy ways are leak credentials. If you go on to Pastebin, if you go on Reddit, if you go on a deep and dark web forum, if you go on Telegram or uh, you know QQ or even Discord, you're gonna find files with just leak credentials in it. Username, email, password combinations. And this is one of the ways that threat actors, you know, maybe the less sophisticated ones, but even the elite groups, the APT groups and ransomware groups, are trying to get ways into your organization. They're just using what others might have already exposed, whether it's through your own organization's breach or through a third party breach that you used your employee login for uh, and then reuse the password. These threat actors can collect these credentials from all those different dumps put them in their own sheet, and then use some whatever 
available cred credential stuffing tool is out there, point it at your URL and just see if they get any hits. Uh, it's, it's that simple. A lot of these tools, again, are automated and you can download off of GitHub or some forum uh, and, and deploy it as simply as that. And in this case for, again, I, I replaced the name with Zumo Bank, we see that David, my coworker, on 2-28-2022, uh, was exposed through a, a third-party breach, and their password was my dictionary password. Not very difficult to to uh, to crack. We also saw on that same day that an account was for sale for SafeMail1.ZumoBank.com. Very similar to that Uber breach, uh, the Uber account that we saw on the previous slide, and in this case was available for for ten dollars. So already we identified two. Uh, potential access, compromised access for this organization where threat actors can get access. Bless you. In fact, if we looked a little further back over the past year using that same safemail.zumobank.com, we saw that there was 337 instances for this particular partner where that very same access was compromised and listed for sale for very cheap on these marketplaces. With proactive threat, intel threat hunting, we could have identified that previously uh, and potentially blocked any impact or threats uh, that would occur from this, uh, but as you can see in this case, we weren't doing this proactively yet. Oh good, you can see it up there. So with this partner, we actually purchased one of these accounts from these dark web marketplaces. This is one of my responsibilities. I maintain uh, all my personas across these different sources. And in this case, we purchased one of these accounts. Again, I removed the actual information from it. But when you buy these accounts from these marketplaces, you can see the types of information reveals. Now in this particular account, there was way more uh, accounts for this particular victim. Uh, that like their Facebook, their Coinbase account was all compromised uh, by one of these uh, uh, malicious stealers. In this case, was Redline Stealer. Uh, but we see that username Zuma one two three four and that same password, my dictionary password, was compromised through the Redline Stealer pro program. And had I not purchased it, a threat actor would have came in here, purchased it themselves, and and see. Uh, exactly what I can see right now and then use it to log into that organization network. So keep Redline in mind because we're, we're going to implement this into our threat hunt as well. It's, you know, we, we know that this, in this case, this is the threat or the, the, the tool that was used to compromise the account. So for our threat hunting, we want to identify, well, how do we defend against this type of program? And with so many accounts listed for, for sale over the past year, we want to see, well, did we have any data leaks that we didn't know about? And in this case, they did. Uh, back in January, January 30th, 2022, the threat actor Christina, if you could see that up there, on a very popular form that is no longer active, uh, thanks to law enforcement, uh, form rate forms, posted a SQL database for Zumo Bank, listed it for sale on rate forms for actually pretty cheap. Uh, and I blurred out the actual evidence here, but Christina, he or she, I'm not sure, uh, but a very well-known threat actor, actually posted screenshots of the leak, which allowed us to quickly validate, oh crap, this is ours. Uh, we need to figure out if any threat actors purchased this from Christina, uh, and we need to now monitor Christina uh, moving forward to see if she's going to continue targeting us. What you're able to do, again, through analysis tools, tools that are collecting intelligence for you and giving you a central location to sort through that intelligence. In this example, um, I don't want to talk too much about vendors, but this is from our platform, where we're able to see that Christina is very active across the deep and dark web, very active on Telegram. Uh, we're able to see that she was selling databases and services across a variety of different sources. We could see 
all the different threat actors that she was communicating with pretty much on a daily basis. So these are threat actors that she was potentially collaborating with or possibly selling the data to. And when we were trying to understand her capabilities, we saw that, okay, based on her previous activity, right around this time when we searched, she also had a out brokers database she was selling and even a CSV file to the US Air Force that she was selling at that time. So we didn't think that this was just a you know case where she got lucky and you know or maybe took the data from another threat actor and re was reselling it. We, we, we believe that she was very capable uh, of getting this access herself um, and potentially targeting us again. I'm not picking on the Air Force either. All the other military branches have been breached in the past as well, even the Marine Corps. We've probably been breached several times. But there was further evidence that Christina uh, was very capable because we see that she was even selling basically pen testing services, footprinting services for organizations uh, across those different forums where threat actors could pay a hundred bucks and she would build a footprint for whatever target you wanted. And she would sell this across these different forums. And if you looked at her post, she would have hundreds of threat actors replying to her, her service with targets, uh, which she would then you know, DM and you know, conduct whatever, whatever transaction uh, that they were gonna do from that point. So in this case, Christina wasn't just some script kitty. Uh, we don't think, she, at the time, we didn't think she was part of like an APT group or a government group or anything like that, but was a very capable threat actor. So we want to now monitor her and proactively uh, uh, analyze her activity in our future threat hunts. So how can we now be more proactive and defend against some of the threats that we saw in those previous slides? Well, Red Line Stealer. Red Line Stealer was the, uh, the obvious uh, malicious program that we observed once we purchased that account from that dark web marketplace. The Red Line stamp was on there, so we know that that, that particular vendor used Red Line in that case. And we want to first see how accessible is Redline, or, or I'm sorry, we want to see what are the capabilities of Redline Stealer. Uh, and all those programs that we saw on that previous page, uh, where you saw Azure, Raccoon, InfoStealer, Redline, and things like that, they all pretty much have the same capabilities. And back in February of 2020, Redline Stealer, which it was relatively new back then, a couple years ago, we knew that the basic build features of this program was it collects from your browsers, it captures your login and passwords, cookies, autocomplete fields, even your credit cards that you've saved in your browser, so on and so forth. Now there are a variety of different versions of all these programs that threat actors put their own flavor on, add their own capabilities to. So when we identify the threats, we want to understand, well, what capabilities are to have because it might allow you to branch off into another threat hunt. Uh, and to you know, identify other threats that you might, might have to worry about. So trying to understand, well, how accessible is this tool? Is this something that we're gonna encounter again? Is this something that we really need to worry about? And this, again, it, this is quite small, but I hope you can see that okay. Uh, a simple search across all these different sources that I'm familiar with, deep and dark web, a clear web, different marketplaces, threat actors can get their hands on these tools very easily. If you did a simple search on raid forums, on breach, on exploit, uh, even on Reddit for Redline Stealer, you're gonna find some link where you can go download this program, buy it from a marketplace, both clear and deep, or at least find a vendor that says they have access to it and they can help you out if you reach out to them very accessible tool along with all those other tools that we see compromising thousands of victims every single day. So we want to then use tools to 
well, how do we identify a red line uh, and how can we see if any of our endpoints are infected with it? Well, that's where virus total comes in. Virus total uh, is very useful because you'll have other analysts, engineers in your field that have identified these threats and have uploaded the information, the indicators for these threats to allow you to use them and block them from accessing your organization. Now, again, there's a variety of versions for these tools because of how accessible it is and threat actors able to put their flavors on it. So something like a hash for a file for that program is gonna change as threat actors manipulate it. But if you use VirusTool, there's enough people identifying these threats within their organization, uh, unfortunately, um, that you can use that, in, that intelligence to better defend yourselves. There's also a post down here in the bottom left that I have um, where it, it was really just a tutorial on a Russian forum uh, where a threat actor was basically telling you how to use the program and it's really just a download and click uh, or push, uh, push to play program. That's how simple it was that the tutorial in that screenshot was basically like, I don't know, 300 words, very easy to use. So now we know the types of assets that we we want to protect. We know the types of threat actors that are known to use those uh, threats. And we know the threats themselves or the programs uh, that are used to target or, or our organizations. So moving forward, because you want to proactively identify these threats through your threat hunting uh, and, and build a, 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 a program that you can repeat every couple of weeks, maybe once a week, every two weeks, every month, whatever you want to set. Um, but you want to identify, once you've implemented new processes, new security policies, after you've conducted your first threat hunt, you want to identify in future threat hunts, have we done a good job at reducing our risk? Um, are threat actors targeting us more? Are they targeting us less? Are our assets more easily uh, targeted? So on and so forth. And with a, an effective program, uh, you can build a program where you can do this analysis, again, uh, very easily and identify these threats and trends. In this case, when we conducted this, threat, this initial threat hunt for this partner, we saw that in the past year there was over a million mentions and threats targeting their critical assets. Uh, it wasn't just, uh, you know, we weren't just searching for one like in the Uber case, we actually identified uh, a dozen or so different assets and we, there was over a million results in the past year, some of which might not have been you know, imminent threats, uh, but threat actors were actively discussing and targeting this organization and looking to get access to them. And if you have an organization that has a lot of money, um, then you're likely targeted as well. But if you conduct these threat hunts, threat hunts over time, then you can see, have we done a good job at implementing, implementing new security policies, new tools to defend ourselves? Because you'll see from time to time, has those mentions gone up? Have they gone down? Are threat actors saying anything different about our organization? So on and so forth. And this is a great, these are great metrics to provide to you, your leadership to get that recognition for the work that you're doing. Are you guys doing a good job? Uh, and showing a decline in, uh, in those mentions, in those threats, it hopefully shows that you are doing a good job. But even if there's an increase, it's gonna allow you to conduct another investigation, figure out, well, why are, why are threat actors targeting us even more now? Was there you know, a recent business transaction that happened in the organization, or a news article about what something your organization did that all of a sudden spurred a lot of activity in the underground for your organization? Or is there an actual threat uh, or vulnerability that you guys weren't aware of that you need to identify? So building that repeatable threat hunting process will allow you to conduct analysis like this and provide those metrics to the people that aren't gonna exactly understand you know, maybe the steps that you've actually applied like we did in the few, last few slides. And then other considerations. Again, evaluating your threat hunts and understanding, well, what can we do now that we've identified these threats to better defend ourselves? 
And some of the obvious ones for initial access type threats, compromised accounts is implementing 2FA, MFA, uh, things like that to add another layer of security so that even if that initial access was compromised, you're gonna need a more th sophisticated threat actor uh, to come up with methods to get beyond those other policies that you have in place. They are out there, there are threat actors can do that. Um, there was a presenter at uh, Beachside St. Pete that was talking about um, a organization, I forget which one it was, where the threat actor was constantly sending requests uh, to their mobile phone to get access to their account. They already had the login and password, but they couldn't get past the, uh, the secure login, so they kept sending uh, the message to the user's phone. The user would not click uh, you know, or approve that it was them making the request. So the threat actor reached out to the victim over WhatsApp and said that they were the IT department. Um, which, if your organization's IT department is reaching out to you over WhatsApp, you should probably not trust it. You should probably get in touch with somebody else and figure out if this is a real request. But they pro it's probably not a real request. Uh, but anyway, in, in this case, the victim actually fell for that um, and then the threat actor got access. So educating your employees is also an important step. Uh, to improving your security. And that's pretty much it. Um, again, these talks that we like to do, um, we try and like to provide you with something that you can actually apply on your own. A lot of the slides that we showed were slides that I've, you know, that I gathered from my own tool, but these are things that you can do manually as well. You can explore the deep and dark web, you can explore these malicious sources out in the open web, uh, and you can obviously explore places like Telegram and things like that. Um, just a little uh, advice, uh, especially for the students in the room. Deep and dark web, I mean, again, it's, it's like a mystery to a lot of people. It's not exactly hard to get access to. All you need is a Tor browser uh, to get access to these sites. Um, but I would caution you if navigating to those sites because there are threat actors on there that are looking to uh, uh, take advantage of uh, you know beginners to those places, uh, people that aren't protecting their identity and are just clicking around willy nilly. Uh, a lot of the files, a lot of the links that you're, that are on there are malicious, and you will expose yourself to pretty serious threats if you get if you navigate there. So. I recommend exploring the different ways that you can keep yourself safe by using premium tools like ours or implementing a dirty machine using programs like, uh, like Tails OS, Linux-based program, uh, uh, or OS that wipes itself every time you, you log off of it and also has VPNs installed uh, to keep you anonymous. So um, because my talk focused a lot on those types of sources, if you are going to investigate them all, just you know, be cautious uh, and try not to click on any links that where you don't know it's not going to navigate to. So that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions? Don't be shy. Just no hard questions. So if somebody posts your credentials online, is that typically sold once and then it's removed, or they sell it as many times as they can? That's a great question. So, it depends on the threat actor. There are plenty of threat actors on forums that will post a bunch of dumps uh, and they'll repost it across a variety of places. Um, and you, you never know if another threat actor has already used them uh, or even if the credentials are valid. But when it comes to these marketplaces, like the ones that I, that I showed on the slides, these are threat actors that have a reputation to uphold and they want people to keep coming back to their market to buy more. Uh, and threat actors, they communicate. So if they were buying credentials that weren't valid, they would, or were resold, they're gonna let everybody else know. Uh, and in every case where I've bought an account, uh, it was always valid. Uh, the username and password was valid. When we purchase it, the account is taken off the market right away. That being said, that the machine that was infected, which harvested those credentials, um, if you don't disinfect that machine, 
it's likely that it's going to identify that once you've identified that, that, that compromise and have changed the account details, privileges, passwords, things like that, that the program that is infecting that machine is going to recognize that the credentials have changed. So in that case, they will sell it again once that program is communicated back to the vendor. They identify, okay, there's a new username, password combination, and they will list it for sale again. But most of the time, they don't resell them because again, they're, they're looking to uphold their reputation. Uh, but again, if you leave that machine infected, you don't remediate it, there's a good chance that they'll list it for sale again once they, they identified that the details have changed. Great question. I have a coin for you, by the way, so don't, don't leave. Go ahead. How to automate it? Premium tools. <laughs> now, so uh, that's what our tool does. Um, there are a lot of tools out there uh, that use web spiders to crawl these types of sources uh, every single day, continuously. That's what we do. We are constantly crawling uh, deep and dark web sources, open sources, messaging platforms, and just collecting everything that we find out there so that threat hunters like yourselves, security engineers, can use tools like ours to find whatever threat uh, uh, your organization might be vulnerable to, no matter the, the priority intel requirements that you have. If you're a, a, a programmer and you can build your own spiders, um, then you can collect the data yourselves. The challenge is going to be knowing what data sources to collect from. Uh, and that's where we come in. We just collect it all. Great question. Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, I work for Cyber Six Skill. We are a threat intelligence provider uh, using automation uh, based out of Israel. And uh, there's, um, we're using complete automation to just collect data from those different sources. We have very few analysts like myself, all of which pretty much have military, law enforcement, or investigative uh, intel analysis backgrounds. Uh, so we do maintain our own personas across these sources. I can't tell you who my personas are. I can't oust myself like that. But we are on those sources, getting access, communicating with threat actors to find new sources and things like that. Uh, so we get that access, and then once we do, we just suck it all out of there. So, great question. Oh, we got more. We got more. That's a great question. So an organization with, oh, sorry, with uh, limited resources, limited tools, uh, I would start consuming feeds. Did you get it? You got it? I would start consuming feeds, threat right, intel feeds. Uh, you know, there's open source platforms like, like MISP, for example. Uh, I think Alien Volt's got their own open source one as well, uh, or free one at least, where you can start ingesting indicators compromised from places like the ISAC feeds, the government type feeds, there are other open source feeds out there as well. And that's at least gonna get you started uh, and give you the ability to at least identify these types of threats um, and, and build uh, playbooks to block these threats from entering your environment. Feeds are a tool that you can use that really an analyst should not be spending their time on anyway. It's something that you can easily just consume and apply a playbook to and automate it rather than spending your time looking at it all, especially with limited resources. Yeah, and with those feeds, you can use it, again, you can use it to just automatically block threats, but then do some internal threat hunting, you know, if you're consuming, you have like a SIM installed, for example, you're ingesting logs from all places, you can easily correlate and see, all right, are any of these indicators, compromised that we're consuming from these feeds actually in our environment, or have we ever observed them? Um, again, it's not as simple as I, I'm stating it, but it at least provides you with a starting point. Um, otherwise, 
having a program like ours is, you know, not every member needs access to something like that because it's, it's going to provide whoever's tasked with that responsibility with visibility into all these different types of external sources with just a few clicks of a button. Um, so maybe considering a tool like that will, will assist your team in uh, getting that visibility. Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to try and get this to you. There you go. Uh, so, for, so first off, reporting to law enforcement. Uh, in some cases we do actually report for law enforcement. Um, uh, again, I, I used to work for them, so we have contacts there. But we actually have law enforcement using our tools um, so that they get the visibility themselves and they can take whatever action they have. They're using tools like ours to identify these sources and take down the sources like in the raid forms case, whatever credit card market is out there, they're constantly taking them down. And then more, um, you know, different types of uh, criminal places like, you know, child exploitation, human trafficking as well. So law enforcement are using these tools themselves to identify these threats. In alerting on them in general though, um, our, we're, you know, uh, the, the doctor, that the, the keynote speaker was talking about AI and ML, uh, we're using our own as well to automatically correlate threats with your critical as critical assets that we've identified to alert you as soon as we collect it, um, which is the benefit of using a tool like ours uh, rather than trying to manually do it alone. Great question. Great question. I'm gonna try. I hope I don't hit anybody. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. That one, there was no, there was no spin to that one. <laughs> sorry about that. If it went too far, I'll get you another one. <laughs> oh my god, that one went real far. So, how do we identify these sources? because they're constantly popping up, new ones popping up. Um, yeah, these sources, especially on the dark web, are very volatile. Um, and it takes, one, knowing where threat actors are navigating the most and communicating the most, because you can monitor those sources to identify the links that they're sharing for a new marketplace or a new telegram group or whatever. Uh, threat actors are sharing the places that they're going to, and oftentimes these marketplaces or forums, these new ones that pop up, are promoting themselves on the sources that everybody's going to already. Um, so that's how you would manually do it, is by navigating and just kind of strolling the forum, seeing where threat actors are usually going to. With our platform, we actually, which I'm grateful for because I don't have to do it anymore, but we're actually automatically identifying those new sources, we're able to identify the links that they share in these different places that threat actors are navigating to, uh, and actually deploy crawlers automatically to start collecting from it. So we got that covered, uh, but you're able to do it yourself as well. It just, you know, it takes uh, timing and knowing where to, to uh, investigate. Over here. <laughs> That's not an easy question to answer. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I'm assuming, uh, you know, you got multiple departments in, in security, in telecom, in whatever organization you are, uh, and you can kind of break it down by responsibilities. For example, the fraud team, if you have a fraud team, they can focus on uh, threats that are targeting your customers um, and identifying the types of threats that those customers are prone to and how they can better defend them. Whereas your security team might focus on those internal assets, the assets that your employees have access to, and they just focus on those types of threats. Uh, you have a vulnerability team. They're responsible for identifying the applications that you guys are running uh, and the vulnerabilities that they might uh, be prone to and then identifying what threat actors are actively targeting, what new exploit kits are out there. So breaking it up by section will allow you to stay focused. 
Great question. Oh, oh, actually, I hate, I hate to be a Debbie Downer. Oh, however, it's, it's the ghost of good questions present. Uh, speakers take note. Apparently, if you give out prizes, you start getting questions. Let's get a round of applause for our speaker, though.